Almost 350 years ago, not far from this spot, began a great fire which destroyed the city of London and rendered over 100,000 people homeless. So the physical legacy of the great fire endures. You think of the Wren masterpieces from St. Paul's to the 25 other steeples that grace the precincts of this city. But the fire's legacy is not limited to how the city looks. It extends to what the city does. And that blaze led Nicholas Barbon to establish the first insurance company, as John Nelson knows, an innovation to fulfill the social need to share risk. Now, public authorities complemented such private initiative with the Royal Pro Proclamation that set standards for wider roads and for houses that were built from stone and brick instead of timber. And Parliament passed the Parish Pump Act to establish fire brigades and improve water supply. So in the end, that spark that began in Pudding Lane ignited much more than a great fire itself, it included a belated recognition that you needed sufficient liquidity to quell contagion, an understanding that clear, well-understood codes contribute to the greater good, and a belief, most importantly, that financial markets can solve real-world problems. From the coffee houses that served as the meeting places for entrepreneurs and merchants, to the exchanges that supported the trading of financial claims, to a central bank that acted as lender of last resort, a rich infrastructure developed to support markets that serve the UK and who serve the world. And as it grew into the world's leading economic and trading power, the UK also became its center of financial capitalism. The city retained its preeminence through market innovation. From euro bonds to emerging market debt, credit derivatives, centralized clearing, this city has continually created new financial products and new markets to serve the real economy. And today, as both the Lord Mayor and the Chancellor mentioned, the city remains the leading global financial center. The UK is the venue for 40 percent of foreign exchange trading volume, half of the OTC derivative trades, two-thirds of the trading in international bonds. More international banking activity is booked here than anywhere else in the world. The UK is host of the third largest insurance sector and the second largest asset management industry. Put simply, UK markets matter for global commerce. But above all, these markets matter for our prosperity. These markets are a major part of the UK economy. 350,000 people are employed in financial services in London alone, and one million across the UK as a whole. On current trends, just retaining market share, on current trends, the UK's non-bank financial system will increase from around six times GDP at present to nearly 15 times GDP by 2050. But the most fundamental thing is that our markets serve our economy. By financing firms to hire, invest, and expand, our markets drive UK growth. By opening up trade and investment, our markets create new opportunities for UK businesses and savers. By transferring risks, our markets help households and businesses insure against the unexpected. And much of this activity, virtually all of this activity, depends on fixed income, currency, and commodity markets. It's therefore vital that they work well, and it's essential that they are seen to do so. Now, although markets can be powerful drivers of prosperity, markets can go wrong. Left unattended, they are prone to instability, excess, and abuse. Markets without the right infrastructure are like cities without building codes, fire brigades, or insurance. Poor market infrastructure here allowed the spark of the U.S. subprime crisis light a powder keg under U.K. markets and triggered the worst recession, the worst recession in our lifetimes. So what are some examples of that poor infrastructure? Think faulty hard infrastructure, like interest rate and foreign exchange benchmarks, 
that were quite literally fixed. Poor soft infrastructure, such as codes of conduct that too few read and too many ignored. And weak banks whose light capital and heavy reliance on short-term funding created a tinderbox. Now, it wasn't just the private sector. Central banks shared in these failings, operating a system of fire insurance whose ambiguity proved anything but constructive when global markets were engulfed in flames. The Bank of England's general approach was consistent with the attitude of FIC markets, which historically have relied heavily on informal codes and understandings. And that informality was well suited to an earlier age, but as markets innovated and grew, it proved wanting. Most troubling, such informality has been exploited in numerous incidents of misconduct that have undercut public trust and threatened systemic stability. This has had direct economic consequences. Mistrust between market participants has raised borrowing costs and reduced credit availability to the real economy. Falling confidence in market resilience has meant companies have held back productive investments. And uncertainty has meant that people have hesitated to move job or home. These effects are not trivial. And they have reduced the very dynamism of this economy in the post-crisis years. Widespread mistrust has also had deeper indirect costs. Markets aren't ends in themselves, but powerful means for prosperity and security for all. And they need to retain the consent of society, a social license, to be allowed to operate, to innovate, and to grow. Repeated episodes of misconduct have called that social license into question. We have all been let down by these developments, and we all share responsibility for fixing them. I would believe that everyone in this room believes that real markets are necessary for sustainable prosperity. Not markets that collapse when there's a shock from abroad. Not markets where transactions occur in chat rooms. Not markets where no one appears accountable for anything. Real markets are professional and open, not informal and clubby. Participants in real markets compete on merit. They don't collude online. Real markets are fair, resilient, and effective. They maintain their social license. But real markets don't just happen. They depend on the quality of market infrastructure. That robust infrastructure is a public good, which will only be maintained if all market actors, public and private, recognize their responsibilities for the system as a whole. Now, given London's preeminent position in global markets, this city has a special responsibility to lead financial reform. And I believe that's one of the reasons why it, ha it has already brought so many ideas and such energy to this cause. Think of what's been accomplished. Financial reform is strengthening the resilience of major banks. Their capital requirements are up tenfold. Their liquid assets have increased fourfold. Trading assets are down by a third. Intra-bank exposures are down by two-thirds. Reform is ending the scourge of too big to fail, eliminating an implicit public subsidy which distorts our markets. And reform is improving risk transfer, transfer by untangling complex webs of derivatives and by creating simple, transparent, and comparable securitization markets. Now, it's a source of great frustration to all of us when such major progress, such real progress, is overshadowed by misconduct. We must break the back of these issues. With the publication of the Fair and Effective Markets Review, all the main building blocks are now in place for the real markets we need. And I would like to join the Chancellor and the Lord Mayor in paying tribute 
to Charles Roxborough of the Treasury, my colleague Manoush Shafiq, and Martin Wheatley of the FCA, who so ably led this review. And I would like to salute Elizabeth Corley, who so expertly chaired the review's independent market practitioners panel, canvassing and coalescing views from across the industry. Now, the complexity of the task that they were set, I think, is best illustrated by the fact that they didn't just find one cause for the challenges we have in markets, but they found five root causes uh, in their review. And specifically, they identify that we had market structures that were vulnerable to conflicts of interest, collusion, and illiquidity. We had standards of acceptable market practice that were usually poorly understood, that were often ignored, and always lacked teeth. Firm systems of internal governance and control were incapable of asserting the interests of the firm, let alone the interests of the wider market, over those of close-knit trading staff. And individual incentives were skewed, with pay packages rewarding short-term returns over long-term value and good conduct. And finally, that personal accountability of which the Lord Mayor spoke and the Chancellor spoke, that personal accountability was lacking, with a culture of impunity developing in parts of the market. All of these factors contributed to an ethical drift. But we made a good start in addressing these deficiencies. There's been an overhaul of FIC benchmarks. There have been improvements in transparencies in some FIC markets. There are new compensation rules, which in the main help align risk and reward. And there are clearer responsibilities for senior managers of banks and building societies and insurance firms. Importantly, at the best firms, they're improving tone from the top, they're launching conduct training, and they're revamping control structures. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. Major gaps remain. And these gaps are evidenced by enforcement actions which continue to appear with depressing frequency. These sanctions, well necessary, aren't the solution. They are not the solution. Not least since $150 billion of fines levied on global banks thus far translates into $3 trillion of reduced lending capacity to the real economy. We need a much better balance between individual and firm accountability. And so we need to ask our question, ourselves the questions, who should be accountable, against which standards, and with what consequences. And in all these regards, I welcome the fir review's four main recommendations. First and foremost, that individuals be held to account. Easy to say, tougher to do because doing so requires new common standards that are cast in clear language. It requires better training and higher qualifications for FIC personnel. And it requires mechanisms to ensure that when individuals are fired, their history will be known to those who seek or seek to consider firing them. Second, it requires that firms take greater responsibility for the system by improving the quality, clarity, and market-wide understanding of FIC trading practices. And here I very much welcome the industry's leadership in drawing up plans for a new FIC Market Standards Board. That board, which is comprised of all the spectrum of the market, that board's mandate will be to establish readily understandable standards, keep them up to date, with market developments and to promote adherence to them. The Fair and Effective Market Review concludes that if firms and their staff fail to take this opportunity to establish common and dynamic standards of market practice, more restrictive regulation is inevitable. Now to give the measures that I just discussed for firms and individuals teeth, key elements of the senior manager's regime should be extended to all firms who are active in wholesale FIC markets, including dealers and asset managers. That means that all senior managers would have clearly defined responsibilities and would be answerable for training, certifying, and monitoring the material risk takers they supervise. 
The FCA should oversee compliance, redeploying resources on senior persons. And in turn, these individuals would be on the hook for promoting compliance within their organizations. In other words, incentives would be aligned. Now, let's be clear. For the best in the industry, for the people in this room, this isn't new. This is just how you run your business. But for others, for those who free ride on your reputation, the age of irresponsibility is over. The third thing we require is that regulators should extend the coverage of market abuse regulation to include every major fixed income and currency market. And criminal sanctions should be updated with market abuse rules similarly extended and maximum prison terms lengthened. And finally, the city knows better than anywhere in the world that we need global standards for global markets. And I welcome the FIC Market Standards Board's intent to be as global as possible in its membership and its influence. And I note that already the major central banks, including the Bank of England, and market participants have just begun working on developing a new global code for FX markets. And I would encourage the securities regulators, IOSCO, to consider complementing these efforts with a similar initiative to cover wider fixed income markets when they meet here in London next week. The Financial Stability Board will engage with these processes while working to improve the alignment between remuneration and conduct risk across the globe. Now, I've said a few times that all must play a role in building real markets, and that includes the Bank of England. In the run-up to the crisis, the bank's contribution to the effectiveness of markets fell short in three respects. And in all cases, we're responding. First, the bank's framework for providing liquidity lagged behind market developments. And it was fortunate that in the jaws of the crisis, the bank innovated rapidly and admirably to avoid a collapse of the system. Now, the lessons learned from that experience are now embedded in a new comprehensive framework for the bank's sterling market operations. With a broader range of eligible collateral, more counterparties, and longer maturities, as well as a central bank that stands ready to act as market maker of last resort, constructive ambiguity has been replaced by open for business. Our second shortcoming was that, like many others, the bank neither identified the risks in the system or the gaps in the regulatory architecture. Following the Chancellor's reforms in the last Parliament, that architecture has been fixed, with the bank now having statutory responsibility to protect and enhance the stability of the UK's financial system. And we are working as one bank to do so. The FPC and the PRA have catalyzed a series of actions to improve market resilience, including stress tests of banks and hedge funds, system-wide capital actions, and new tools like leverage ratios and minimum repo haircuts. Now, the third shortcoming was the bank's arcane governance, which blurred the lines of the bank's accountability and, by extension, weakened that social license of markets. Before my arrival, the bank's government's governance was reshaped with a strengthened court and independent reviews. And I welcome the government's intention to introduce legislation that would further strengthen the governance and accountability of the bank. We will continue to modernize our operations, and we'll, we will reinforce our commitment to openness and transparency. The minutes of court meetings are now published with minimal delay, and transcripts of MPC meetings will be released with appropriate lags. Whenever there are difficult issues, outside reviews of the bank's performance will be conducted, publicly released, and acted upon. Now, let me be clear. The bank expects its senior management to meet the highest standards of professional conduct. So we're introducing today a new code of conduct for everyone at the bank. And I can also announce that the bank will apply the core principles of the senior manager's regime to our own senior staff, including to the governor. This is in addition to existing obligations and scrutiny 
from court, from parliament, from the media, and from the general public. Look, we welcome such scrutiny of our activities, including open debate about the cumulative impact of reform on the functioning of markets. In particular, while the core of the system, the core of the system has been made much more resilient, the combination of new prudential requirements on dealers and structural changes in markets has reduced market depth and increased market volatility. And this process has likely further to run particularly as the normalization of global monetary conditions edges closer. More expensive liquidity is a price well worth paying for a system that at its core is more robust. Removing public subsidies is absolutely necessary for real markets to exist. Volatility characterizes real markets and much of the pre-crisis market-making capacity amongst dealers was ephemeral. That said, the possibility of sharp, unpredictable changes in market liquidity poses a clear risk to financial stability, particularly when some market participants take liquidity for granted and crowd into trades in anticipation of central bank action. And the bank is keenly alert to such risks and welcomes perspectives on whether the market, regulation, or both should adjust for the good of the system as a whole. Now, by this point in the evening, you'll be relieved to know that I'm nearing the end of my speech. Um, but it, I want to stress that tonight, with the publication of FEMER, cannot mark the end of our efforts. We do have the main building blocks of reform in place, and now is the time to take stock. And it's vital that we, the public and private sectors, work together to reverse that tide of ethical drift. But this cannot be a one-off exercise. We need continuous engagement of all stakeholders so that market infrastructure can keep pace with market innovation. And that's why the bank is announcing that we will hold an open forum this autumn which will bring together all stakeholders in fixed income, currency, and commodity markets. This will be an opportunity to discuss the prospects for market functioning, where regulations might overlap or conflict, and whether enough has been done to build real markets that the UK deserves. In order to prompt an open discussion, we're publishing a detailed paper which reviews these issues and draws out such questions. Now, everyone well beyond this room has an interest in the future of financial markets. And I would encourage strongly everyone here and beyond to engage with our open forum process, both online and at the conference itself. Lord Mayor, our response to recent failings should be as ambitious as those of our predecessors to the Great Fire. Renewed prosperity built on private markets and public market infrastructure. Let our legacy be the earthly equivalent of Wren's ethereal genius, real markets, so that the city can do what it does best, transact and innovate for the good of the people of the United Kingdom and the world.